Hey everyone, this is the latest LEGO Star Wars Millennium Falcon for The Rise of Skywalker. I'm going to take you through a quick look at all the major features, functions, and figures for this set, and then come back and take a bit of a deeper dive and look at some finer specifics, and also respond to your questions and inquiries that were posed by viewers during the preview period. LEGO has made a number of Millennium Falcons roughly this size, and most of them have used the same basic build. This is the first one in a number of years to break the mold and try to do things a bit different. Around the outside, it looks pretty well detailed for something that's not intended to be a top-of-the-line collector's model, with a good amount of, of change of color. It's not all just the plain gray. You got a good amount of the dark gray also the dark tan and the dark red. From the right side docking port all the way around the back is a band of sub-assemblies that are made with studs facing outwards. So you can see that the tops of pieces are all facing towards us here. And that just continues all the way around to the other side and just a little bit farther as well past the left side docking port. And there's a fair amount of greebling or detailing for the sake of detailing. This one has a round radar dish again for the Rise of Skywalker. The original series had a round one that got replaced in the sequel series uh, with a rectangular one, which then got broken off. So now we've gone back to round, and this is on a ball joint. So it's actually able to rotate around any kind of way that you want and stay that way. There's a little bit of friction in there. Also using a ball joint on top is the quad laser cannon, which is also on a turntable, so that can spin all the way around. I like the the finer detailing used here with these small minifig ski poles in dark gray. And this is able to almost face completely straight up. So a good range of motion there, though uh, there's a kind of weird little narrow neck part to it. There's also one of these on the underside. And that does match up pretty well and looks pretty good if you look at this from a low angle. But we'll talk more about the, the underside of the entire model a little bit later. Mostly physical parts are used for the detail that you see here, but there are some stickers. So for this entire hallway cover over here, they've got a number of stickers that are lined up. And most of the, the decorations that you see on top that are clearly just on regular flat pieces do use stickers and not prints. The exceptions being the, the uh, canopy, the main canopy top and also the front. And we'll get inside of that. But I want to focus in on something that is new for this model, and that's the way that the pie slices on the top are done. Traditionally, each one of these little sections would be a separate part that would open up and there would be gaps between them. With the new one, this one here, you have entire sections that open up. So that's one section there. This is one small one, which is an anomaly for this model. And then there's another large section here that opens up. And also at the front, you can take the center rectangular area, move all that, together open all this as one and open all this as one so you get really good access to the interior and the interior is actually usable this is the most open space i've seen on the inside of one of these since the very first one that they made back around the the turn of the century it has a nice open lounge area with the game table right there and they've used stickers for the backs of the kind of leather style couches there and plenty of space to pose figures standing all around here you can actually put a figure let me just grab one pretty close to the edge surprisingly to the outside edge and close up the top that is one thing that folks asked me about see i can actually close up the top fully right there and it's just barely it's just over his head about a millimeter over his head so you can put figures all throughout all of this space standing up you just need to keep them away from the absolute outer edges of it. Of course, they can sit down in the seats. This one's able to rotate around and also angle, so you can change that up. You've got the nice computer system set up right there with some stickers. You can put figures in there if your fingers are small enough, and you can pass them through to, you know, to suggest that they're actually walking around. This is the closest we've gotten to a navigable corridor going out to the cockpit. You're not able to get all the way there, but there's at least a suggestion of it. So, and you are able to put figures down in there. As you move back around the back, this is like the galley area that they've set up here. Sorry about that, there we go. It's very, very simple, definitely. A bit lacking in detail there, but at least it is open and usable space 
just to show. I think I can get it to about right there. That might be a little bit. That's just, yeah, it's just past. So if I move him back just one, there we go. So he can stand in that far in. Sorry, I just knocked this off, but this is just clipped on. So you can pull these off entirely if you want, but this is all usable space where you don't need to worry about packing up your figures you know, if you've got them in there. This is also the hidden smuggling compartment, which is down below. You can pull a couple of pins and drop that out if you want, but it's, it's just not the, not the simplest, easiest thing. A couple of beds set up over here. The two studs at the end are set up to allow a figure to lay down and be held there. Again, they will stay in place. And this is the hyperdrive unit. So you can suggest that you are doing a little bit of work on it that uses a single sticker on top, has some trans uh, light blue pieces underneath to make it look like it's glowing a bit. And there is a wrench nearby for your repair needs. The whole thing definitely could use more detail on the inside, but at least the space is available, which is a bit of a luxury these days on the insides of a lot of things from Lego, not just vehicles and ships, but even buildings. There's also space to pose figures to be operating the laser cannons. So all this opens up and their spot is down in there. They've got a little sled that you can pull out and put two figures on this and those are the controls. So one face is up, one face is down, and it's pretty accurate to the way this would actually work. So you can just put them in there and then imagine that the minifigures are actually operating the cannons. That works pretty well. Oh, I almost forgot. There are also spring-loaded shooters. You can see the tip of one right there. There's also one on the other mandible, and you fire those by just sticking your finger in this hole on the top. And finally, all the way down below, there is a ramp that can be lowered, but you know how they say it's the thought that counts? Well, I feel like there wasn't a whole lot of thought put into this because there's no way a minifigure can even think that they are going down that. You can put a minifigure on the ramp from above and then lower it, but it it's just not believable at all. So let's look at the figures. This is a Millennium Falcon with no Han Solo to pilot it. So the main character now is Lando Calrissian, and it's old man Lando Calrissian at that. So the the vertical thing that looks like a staff weapon of some sort, it's a cane. It's a walking stick. They made, they made it work. You know, this outfit, just everything about it with the color, and especially that torso print and the color and everything, just looks so much like it's from original series Star Trek. I don't know what's going on with the blaster. It has a small element added to the end of it. We'll see what that's supposed to represent in the actual movie. This moves around very easily. It, it holds on there decently well, but I worry that a lot of people will lose that piece. They do have one spare in the set, but it's not a very common part in that color so do be careful with that the cape is set up with two pieces one for the huge collar and one for the main piece it's double-sided very nice deep deep rich black around the back with the i guess as dark as your around the front nice colors looks like a bella lugosi era uh vampire there old old school dracula and there's the print on the back of the torso, which is pretty good in quality, and his alternate face. Chewbacca is Chewbacca. There are no new changes to him for this season. He's got the printed legs down there. The torso has no print on it whatsoever because it doesn't need any. And he's got his old school bandolier on and everything. So this is just a pretty straightforward second generation Chewbacca with the fireable stud shooting bowcaster. Thin has really good printing for the torso especially, and also decent work for the hip and leg pieces, but needs a little bit more opacity there, just the legs don't pop as much as the torso does, which, you know, it's just really, really finely done. He's got his man purse there. Don't call it a messenger bag, it's a man purse. Come on, just be honest about it. That's a gunmetal gray colored blaster again, and his hair has grown a bit, gained a little extra texture, and he also has an alternate face. Here is Bulio. <laughs> He's new for Rise of Skywalker, and it's a very interesting looking figure. Uh, I just think it looks cool, and I think it's pretty well done. Now, this one has very good printing from top to bottom. Uh, it's helped out by the slightly lighter color. You know, it's more difficult to print nice colors against a, a darker 
base plastic, but this is just well done. Front and back, head to toe. Doesn't have any printing along the sides or anything. The uh, head is dual molded. Has some pretty good shaping around the sides, like around the neck and under the jaw. The horns are a different type of plastic. It's not the softest, most flexible type of plastic, but it's like the material that Lego usually uses for small barbs and things. So it does have some flex. It's not likely to really stab you and not likely to be broken off. C-3PO. I think this is the first C-3PO that I've personally gotten that is made of all just the newest of gold colored pieces. Uh, for a while they were in a transition phase when they went from one pearl gold to a newer pearl gold. So the newer one is better, looks more gold-like and is more consistent and that results in just overall a good looking figure. A lot of people still would like to see a dual molded right leg for him, but he doesn't have that. And he does have both gold arms back that is correct for this time in the series. And the eyes are painted on there with just a little bit of indent for the suggestion of a pupil. No red-eyed version of him yet, but for what it is, I think that this is a well enough done figure. You could always ask for more, but it's not bad, and it's a lot better than they've been in the past. R2-D2, uh, we've gotten pretty used to this version of R2-D2 by now, and I personally have gotten pretty used to the head print being, as I always say, wonky every single time. Look at how angled it is. See, it's nice and low at this corner, but then at this corner, it's nice and high. Like, choose one and just go straight across. I never, ever get an astromech droid that has perfectly horizontal printing all the way around. They're always at an angle, and it's very frustrating to me. I've seen some folks who have gotten good ones, so I know they exist, but I've just had consistent bad luck. And last up, this is Dio, one more small, cute, maximally merchandisable Star Wars droid. This just has an anti-stud on the base. It's very small, so, you know, it's not all that much you can ask for it. It does not roll. It has an anti-stud on, there's going to be a stud on the back. You could potentially use this to create some custom things. You, know, you can insert a bar into that. You can put a tile on the back of it or what, whatnot, but this is just the way that it's designed to, to look and has some printing going across the top. Now the print on this one is set up pretty well and just for the sake of scale. So compared to an R2 unit, you know, this is very, very small and compared to a figure. Here are the leftover pieces from the set, including one extra spring-loaded shooter bolt and also an extra stud for the stud shooter, the bowcaster. Those two are intended to be included and the rest are truly spares. So that does it for the quick review segment of this video for folks who are in a hurry. Thank you very much for watching. I'm now going to spend some more quality time looking at this thing and also comparing it to a previous version because in my preview video, I got over 500 comments in the first day, well over 500. So thank you very much for all of that feedback. Most folks wanted to see a comparison between the new Falcon and the old Falcon. So let's talk about or at least the previous one. So let's talk about what's changed, what you know, what's different, what's better, and also what's worse. And I, I accidentally did this, what's better, what's worse. I didn't necessarily mean that because not everything is better about the new one, at least in my opinion. First of all, size. A lot of people asked about size, saying that the new one looks smaller. It does look smaller, but it's actually very, very similar in size. The width is essentially identical. The length on this one is slightly shorter. It's shorter by about three studs, or uh, two centimeters, I think is what it came to, which is less than an inch. So it is a bit shorter, but not all that much. The main reason that this looks smaller is that the, the dish portion of it, the major top circular area of it, is smaller. So if you just measure from here to here, that is quite a bit less than the, the overall size of this. It, it looks more like you have a smaller circle here. And that's because of the way that the edges are cut off. The major, major difference, well, there are two major differences, three really, uh, and you can go farther than that. But one of the big things here is that the new one has these whole sections, right? You don't have the individual pizza pie pieces that come open like this, the way that the last X number of them have. And I don't still have the one from the Solo movie, 
Sorry about that, so I'm not able to compare it to that. I just personally was not interested in holding on to that one, but this is the version from 2015, which is you know, much closer to the exact same thing that we're looking at here. So the old one had all these individual hinges, so I can pull one of these off, and you know, it's just bars going into clips to hold these in, and that left gaps between each. Every single one of those had a gap there, gap there, if there's enough light in the room, then you can see inside as well. This one has very little of that gapping issue, at least as viewed from the top. Now there are still some gaps that can be viewed from the top. You've got this gap right here, and also on this side, not quite so much. There's definitely one right here, which is a little bit annoying to me personally. But most of the stuff, I mean, there's a little bit here, but that's not that bad. You know, most of the, the main surface back here is done pretty well, sealed up pretty well. And they just used really, really thin, really narrow wedge plates to accomplish that. A lot of people asked, how is it done? Hopefully, looking at it up close, we'll let you see how they've put them end to end. So a right wedge and a left wedge, going back to a right wedge, just alternating back and forth. And ultimately, those are connected mostly with hinges, hinge plates on the underside. So you can see those along the edge up here. And then there's a row of them going down the center that ultimately just hold them together. And that's what they've done here, 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 and here. All those are done the same. There's also a gap back here, and there's there are a little bit of you know, suggestions of gaps. Some of those are covered a layer below as viewed from the top. But overall, you know, they've solved for the most part a major problem, major complaint of a lot of fans of of lego and fans of star wars about the old ones that have all used the same basic design having all these gaps and a lot of people just did not like that i mean look at that by comparison especially up here at the front you know it's not as bad at the back not as bad but around the sides like that center section is not too bad but here that is bad when you compare it compared to what we have now compared to what we know we can get now from lego yeah new is significantly better but the new does still have an issue a major issue with with gaps and it's a new one so if i flip this up <laughs> if it is if it is placed on a uh, a desk or a, let's let's say like up on a hutch or something you know where it's at a higher level you have this huge gap underneath and it's accentuated by the fact that there's a black plate used right there it's it's actually not as thick of a gap as it looks like but they've got darker colored pieces here a darker colored piece back there and it just really really looks significant it's not as bad on this side but it's still there so there's a trade-off less gappage from the top a lot less look at that but from the front that's not so good Especially on this side, this side bugs me even more. And it has a, a different attachment method. This one's only attached over here on the corner. Uh, again, just hinging the same, built basically the same, same basic techniques to accomplish all that. But yeah, it's, it's just different. And I wish they had built up the underside under here to fill in some of that gap. Another major change on this one compared to the old is, look at the shape of the mandibles. So this all comes in along the side almost perfectly. Just, you know, starts, it's, it's, it's round, gets to a tangent, and then just continues that tangent straight on. That's the way that it's supposed to be. This is much closer to the, the proper shape of the Millennium Falcon. Same thing happens over here. It's cut with the, the cockpit, which has to be this size or thereabouts in order to fit at least two figures in there. But the old one, by comparison, had the narrower mandibles, and they're longer and they're sharper, and the edge, especially over here where it's extra noticeable, is not a continuous, you know, it doesn't just continue from a tangent, it actually angles out. So that was quite a bit different, and a lot of people have pointed that out and have not liked that. And, you know, I didn't used to mind it that much. I was like, yeah, it's Lego, it doesn't have to be perfect. They've got the basic shape here. But now that I've seen the new one, oh, it's so much better. That's what I want to see for sure. So that is a, a significant change. Another thing that is significant to some, not everybody will notice it at first, is the placement of the cockpit. Let's see if I can get these lined up a little bit, a little bit better. So again, the, the mandibles are a little bit longer here. The overall length is a little bit greater. Here, I'll just line up the uh, 
There we go. Line up the docking ports. And uh, the cockpit is farther forward on this one. Here it's pulled back in, and the angle of the corridor out to the cockpit is, you know, is much closer to this this uh, this horizontal bisection line, I guess, as, as viewed from the top. So here it's like this, and they canted it back. So from here they moved it back. Again, I think that just helps with the overall look, makes it look a little bit more accurate. I am going to move on from the shape and size comparison shortly, but I did want to make sure that for the many, many folks who wanted to, to really focus on the comparisons between these two, I would be able to see these from different angles. And here you can really see the difference in gap over here also that the cockpit is lower on the newer one. And here's the view around the back. You know, I, I really used to love this use of the flexible tube around the back here. It just seemed like a perfect piece to get that nice consistent glow kind of suggestion, but the new one is just so much brighter and more appropriate in its height. You know, it really looks like an engine bank back there. And I think that this is an improvement. It's, it's not 100% improvement. Again, looking at how things are going with the gaps here, at least you have less gaps around the side, but you do see this, this weird angling or it angles up, angles down here compared to the old one that was a little bit more consistent, but did consistently have gaps at every single pie slice. This in general is just covered up better from every angle. Now, a lot of you have asked me about playability with this new ship, the actual swishability to the ability to do this right here, to pick it up and fly it around. Am I worried? about this falling apart and also how does it compare again to the last one well i can tell you for sure that this is more sturdy than the last one i'm just exp I'm, I'm expecting to fail here because i'm running the camera now but this is definitely more sturdy than any of the ones that they've done before because here's the big look at the underside the main technic frame the chassis underneath is stronger this time. They use more box, more boxes, more rigid boxes all around, where the other one had more gaps, where you had nice longitudinal coverage, but then side to side, not so much. So this is definitely covered up much better. They've also got uh, sandwiching with larger plates that are used well to hold those Technic boxes together. And just generally speaking, this is pretty strong. The things that I worry about most for playing with this, for swishing it around, are these panels, these small panels at the back. Because if you are grabbing it from the, from the back with your huge figure hand back here, if you're not careful, that thumb is going to come down and pop off a small piece like that. It's not a big deal, but it is something that you do have to consciously think about, I believe. I think I automatically do think about it, but this is a fairly safe spot right here. Put a thumb up there, and, you know, the bottom, whatever fingers you have under here can go pretty much anywhere. You don't have to worry too much. But this is able to take some good pressure from the top. You can see a little bit of bending there, but, you know, put more of your pressure here. Or you can just grab it from the sides. So these docking ports, like, this is a a a side-to-side -side area of strength. I don't, I don't know what you call that. It's, it's, it's almost like a like a beam going through it. Like, that's your, your I-beam there that is super strong. So... You, even you know younger kids can grab this with two hands from the sides just focus on these not on these parts here which are able to move around and ultimately be popped off as entire assemblies right but focus on the sides and this is super strong it's actually more strong there's less to worry about here this is this is good this is i'm actually twisting it right now and nothing is happening this is very good for a play i can grab it with one hand from the side you know, <laughs> do stuff like that. You go upside down, yeah, it's going to open up. And if you have any figures that are not secured in there, they're going to fall out. But secure them, you know, attach them with studs. And you're actually in pretty good shape with this thing overall. It's it's dang strong. It's, de it's clearly designed for durability and to be messed with like this, to be played with, which is fantastic because a lot of the time, Especially bigger Lego things really aren't designed to be messed with to that degree. Let me compare it to the the last one already. I grabbed it from here, and I'm, I'm already feeling flex in there. That's interesting. I thought it was stronger than that. So here, this is good. 
So you do definitely have that strength on the, the 2015 version down, down the center part. So here, this is good. This is nice and strong. In the back, not quite so much. And I, I can see the flex and you can see it too, right? And it just doesn't feel confidence inspiring right there. Looking at the underside of this one, it can be turned upside down as well. Uh, you see, you know, you've got more of these gaps from front to back. It did have some of the sandwiching, but it's just not as good. It's not as strong. I can flex this much more easily. But you are able to grab this from the sides. Uh, I don't see any major problems with durability with this either, personally. But I feel like the, the new one is stronger overall and can be handled in more different ways. Yeah, I, I'm not confident right there with that grip. I can feel things flexing on the top and on the underside. So that brings me to the biggest question, the most scary question, which has been asked by a number of viewers and also by just me. Is this the one? Is this the Millennium Falcon to own? I'm not going to compare this to the Ultimate Collector Series one because that's a ridiculous comparison. The Ultimate Collector Series one is fantastic. It looks amazing. It's by far the most realistic depiction that that they've ever done and probably that you'll ever get from lego at least for decades to come i would i would expect it's amazing it's fine art in lego form yet actually buildable from instructions with regular pieces and no uh, no illegal connections or anything i'm not going to compare that to this because that's not for the same people uh, this is for normal people, I would say, who aren't rich and who don't have a ridiculous amount of space to display one single Lego set in their house. I think the uh, the size is even more of an issue than, than the cost for that one. But for something that's reasonably sized, and I'll talk a little bit more about value uh, at the end of this video here, uh, as we talk about costs specifically, but as as a model, as as a build, I'd say absolutely yes, this is the one to get. If I, if I personally, as a Star Wars fan, as someone who in, what was it, 1981, touched his first uh, physical Lego, it's not, not Lego, uh, Star Wars product, you know, Star Wars toy, and it was the original Kenner Millennium Falcon. Uh, if I could only have one that Lego has made to date, it would absolutely be this one. No doubt. No doubt without question. It's just the best looking. It looks the most like the real thing. And it's easy to convert this. It, I, you don't even have to convert it. You can just leave it like this and call it an original trilogy one. Is it a little bit too colorful? Maybe. But I like I like the, the differences in color. You can do color swaps if you want, make it all just plain gray. But the real thing does have, you know, the real models used in the movies. Even in the original trilogy, did have different colors. They weren't all just gray or you know off-white or anything like that. Uh, but certainly, if you want, you know, if you want it to look a little bit newer, you can swap out some colors, and it will very quickly look much better. Even just changing out the red and the dark tan, which is just a handful of pieces, which are very common and easy to get, much more common than the wedge plates, will take you to a spot that's much more. I think uh, in line with what people expect in their mind's eye from original trilogy. But this is just, it's just well done. And this is good. I hate the gaps at the front now, but from most angles, this does look significantly better than anything they've done up to this point. I personally will probably look to put something in there, stack up some plates or something, and especially over here to fix those gaps, or at least to help with those gaps a bit. And uh, then I think there won't be anything that I like less about this. With one exception. Interior. I mentioned that this has the most interior space that I remember seeing. It has the most open interior space. I'm going to do one more comparison now. You see how open this is? And it's, and it's very good that they allow you to actually stand figures in there in many places. However, the last one had more interior detail. They had more stuff in there. Most of it is just junk, but it is detail and it it does feel a little bit more lived in and livable to me, just with all this stuff. And also the, the hyperdrive unit on this 
is so much nicer. You know, having both stacks there and this, this center section, that's, that's way better. I don't think they needed to make it this complex, but I prefer this any day over the, the little single stack that they have on the, the new one, which is just not as good. But everything else, I mean, the, the detail of the bed there is just so simple here. Uh, this area is okay, but I mean, the part where you actually sit is not so good. And even over here, this chair is so basic. And there's a single sticker for the, the computer console there. So this definitely feels more than four years older to me in its level of design and accuracy and, and care. There's more overall detail here, less usable space. The last thing I'm gonna talk about is value here. So this is $160 US, which is $10 less than the last Millennium Falcon, the Kessel Run one, the solo movie one. Thank goodness for that, because that was just too expensive. But that does make this one $10 more than the 2015 Force Awakens one. And that's less than the expected difference attributable to inflation alone. In other words, if you left the 2015 Force Awakens Millennium Falcon on a shelf with no price on it, no sticker on it, it should cost $162 US today. This costs $160. So given that, I can't complain about the price relative to the previous one. Still, well, to the Force Awakens one. Still, it's a lot of money. Without question, it's a lot of money for a toy, whether you're going to use it as a toy to actually play with, or you're going to use it as a collectible to look at, maybe occasionally open up and play with a little bit, you know, or a lot. It, it is it is a lot of money, to be sure. But I think that for what you get here, for an improved product, that is a good product, that is the best one that they've done like this to date, I think that it really comes down to Lego being expensive. But as Lego goes, as Lego products go, uh, this is, I think, I think a fair deal. I'd love to see it cheaper. Absolutely. I'd love to see pretty much all Lego sets cheaper. Lego is expensive. You pay for quality. You pay for design work. You pay for Lego profits. Just being honest about it. I mean, it it's okay. Profits are what allow us to buy stuff. Profits are what allow you to have the device that you're using to look at this video right now. You know, world runs on money, but within the realm of what we're talking about here, I think that this is fair given that it is essentially the same price as the 2015 one, simply adjusted for inflation, similar number of pieces, similar uh, selection of minifigures, and better design. As always, I recorded the build of this set so you can see it in real time form with really good sound over on my Pure Builds channel. Or if you don't have that much time, you can check out the Speed Build, which is still available to be sped up even further if you want to use the video speed feature on YouTube. I will link to both of those right now. Thank you very much for watching. I hope that I answered a bunch of people's questions. And if you have any more, feel free to comment down below. I will talk to you again very soon.